6 a.m. tomorrow in the coffee shop. And for, the, for your departures to airport, please note that uh, for international uh, flights, you should report to the ITDC travel desk uh, near the reception four hours before your, before your flight time. And for all the domestic flights, kindly report to ITDC desk uh, three hours before the flight time so that they can make uh, arrangements for your bookings, uh, the taxi and all that. Thank you. Uh, all the participant delegates, uh, your certificates are also ready at the registration counter. Once you go out of this, after the conference is over, this forum meet is over, you can take your certificates along with, there is a kit, medical kit also, which is complimented to you. Oh, uh, okay, well, it was my pleasure to um, announce the, the, the forum discussion sessions. What we will do is, um, the, 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 it will be, we've decided to roll it into one discussion session. And given the fact that we have lost a little bit of time on our programming, I would like to continue until 6 o'clock the latest. So the program would be extended with uh, a half an hour, but I think... It will be very valuable time uh, that we can have now to discuss a number of themes. And I first want to give um, uh, the word to the co-chair of the, the pre-lunch session, uh, Dr. Lohar, uh, because he wants to make a brief statement. And then we're going to move on to the discussions. Thank you. Congratulate to our dynamic Director General CCRS, Dr. Manchanda, for organizing such an excellent international conference on regulations in homeopathy and their quality control and pharmacopoeia aspects. So, I am the former Director of Homeopathic Pharmacopoeia Laboratory, Gaziabad. I have worked in the homeopathy for 33 years, and during these periods, we come across the all the manufacturers, the professionals, and consumers also. And during this period, we come across a lot of uh, new aspects. And from yesterday and today, we have heard excellent presentations from various speakers. And so few points came to my mind, so I would like to share with you that everybody is discussing about the safety and toxicity studies presentations so everybody is talking about the safety and toxicity in homeopathy so here i would like to say okay, how it is justified to blindly follow the safety and toxicity parameters in homeopathy which is followed by the modern medicines and other herbal system of medicines like Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha and uh, traditional Chinese medicines and all other systems. Where the drug is acting on the physiological dose, whereas in case of homeopathy, we have a different parameters, we have a different philosophy. So, uh, now there are four parameters, safety parameters. First is heavy metals then pesticide residues, microbial load, and then aflatoxins. So I would like to emphasize on the heavy metals because I heard in the presentations given by the French and German and other scientists also. So the heavy metal limits as prescribed by WHO and it is same except by the government of India. So lead, it's 10 ppm, arsenic 3 ppm, cadmium 0.3 ppm, and mercury is 1 ppm. It's a, some typing mistake is there. 
And then the European pharmacopoeia, the limit is for the lead is 5 ppm and mercury 0.1 ppm. Rest is the same. So if we see the homeopathic drug preparations, now you see the herbal drugs used. In other system, it is used in the form of either as a powder. In Ayurveda, Yunani, we call it say churunas. And or it is used as a aqueous decoctions prepared by boiling with water. So in case of all heavy metals, they are either present in the form of salts or in the elemental stage. So they are, we can say, mostly soluble in aqueous extract. They are soluble in waters. So if, if we take the total solids of these decoctions, it will come to 10 to 30 percent. Whereas in case of homeopathy, we are preparing mother tinctures where alcohol water mixture is there and the alcohol range is from 40 percent to 90 percent alcohol is there. So in this alcohol water ratio, there is a very least possibility that these inorganic salts will dissolve and come in our mother tinctures. Second thing is, we are preparing the mother tinctures by the cold extractions. Whereas in case of other systems, they are preparing the decoctions by boiling with the water. So in cold extraction, again, there is a very least possibility to count these heavy metals in our mother tinctures. If we take the total solid also, so all industries, they know that the mother tinctures total solid comes to 1 to 30 percent average. So not more than that, whereas in case of other system of medicines, this total solid comes to up to 30 percent. So now in case of our homeopathy, we have a drug strength of one tenth. So our first preparations, which we call it say mother tincture or mother solution. So there our drug strength is tenth, one tenth. So in that ratio, if we take, suppose our raw drug contain 10 ppm of lead. So maximum possibility in mother tincture, it will be one tenth. So it will not be more than one ppm. Similarly, the arsenic, the, if it is a three ppm, then in our mother tinctures, the maximum possibility is 0.3 percent. Cadmium, 0.03 percent. Mercury, again, 0.1 percent. So in this ratio, I don't think that we have to enforce the heavy metals for homeopathic drugs. Now, herbal drugs, if we take the dose size, in case of herbal Ayurveda, Yunani, or Siddha, or other herbal preparations, normally the physicians prescribe one teaspoon two to three times a day. And one teaspoon is equal to five ml volume. And one ml is equal to 18 to 20 drops. Whereas, so for five ml, it comes to approximately 200 drops. Whereas in case of homeopathy, maximum low potency drugs are just prescribed either two drops or five drops at a time. And average prescription is twice in a day. So if you take the average, then we are having hardly 10 drops per day. Whereas in case of other system, it is 200 drops. So if you take the dose ratio of the herbal drugs, as well as the homeopathic drugs, it will come to about 200 ratio to 2.5 ml. So there is a vast difference between the homeopathic system as well as the other system of herbal products. So we cannot compare these herbal products of other system with the homeopathy. Now, the homeopathic drugs, mostly as I have learned from the yesterday's presentation from the French and German scientists, that their minimum prescription dose is 2C. And if you see it, 2C, it means its drug strength is 1 upon 10,000 times. 10,000, or if, the, if we take it in the percentage, then it is 0.0001%. So in this percentage, even if the heavy metals are there, you cannot expect. The drug percentage is 100 ppm, and if I convert it into the further ppm, then it will go to trillion. 
so parts per trillion. So in this way, I, I can say that all homeopathic drugs, even in the toxic levels, will be safe in this dilutions. So, so <coughs> we can say the safety parameter and toxicity parameter, which is applicable for other system of medicines. Uh, one minute, we please. Can, okay. So we cannot um, comply. We cannot say that the same parameter should be applicable for the homeopathic medicines. It means that we are unnecessarily putting a regulatory burdens on homeopathic industry by putting the limits which are applicable for allopathic and other herbal system of medicines. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, so I want to open the forum discussion uh, um, session. We uh, have an hour for it. I would have had hoped to have more, but but I think in some ways we wanted to give everybody a voice during this, uh, this first forum, and I think everybody deserved and needed to be heard. So I think the fact that we've lost a bit of discussion time is a sacrifice that I think was worth making in the end. So, but we have one hour. I want to cover, broadly speaking, uh, three uh, topics. One is the, from the session before lunch, the whole topic of innovation. Uh, the, in other words, new drug development was touched upon. And uh, for instance, uh, how can there be more research on homeopathic products? How can, for instance, there be mechanisms or regulatory mechanisms that would give industry incentives uh, to conduct uh, research and development and to invest more than they would currently do into research and development. So there's one block. We'll start off with that. The second block will be harmonization. And sort of the key question I think we should try and get a feeling for is that, well, harmonization is a good thing, but we also have an enormous amount of diversity. So where is the balance uh, in terms of Yes, at certain levels we should try and harmonize, but maybe at other levels we shouldn't. That we get some sense of proportion, uh, where is the common ground and where maybe should we not even look uh, for, should we not even strive for harmonization because the diversity is simply too big. That's the second block of, of uh, the discussion. And the third one is sort of flowing from all the discussions over the last few days. In terms of the regulation of homeopathic medicinal products, what are the strategic priorities that maybe, or hopefully all of us can agree upon, that are really important to work on collectively as a community? Uh, and maybe what are the top priorities and maybe what are the important but slightly less uh, um, uh, urgent matters? So that's the third block, and then we'll spend 10 minutes on uh, maybe next steps uh, and summing up. So that's, that's roughly uh, how I want to do it. So I want to start by asking um, um, uh, Gunther Herr, who, the, who spoke yesterday on the legal matters, that this is an issue of intellectual uh, property and uh, protection mechanisms uh, that can be maybe built in or not built into the development of homeopathic drugs. And what is his view as, a, as, a, as an industry player that industry uh, could contribute or would want to see for them to invest more into research. Um, thank you, Robert. That was a very comprehensive question. Um, I tried to answer it very short. As far as I understood, you asked me specifically about the question also to protect um, the results in clinical research um, which is um, gathered, and on the other hand, that was one part of the question I understood, and the second one was more general, what could be done um, from the regulatory perspective um, to make um, investment into research more attractive, if I got it correctly. So I would like to start answering the first question, which is really a difficult one. I mean, quite a, a while ago, it was quite easy Somebody did a clinical trial, published the result in a, in a, um, in a journal, and then basically um, shared the results, if they were positive, with the authorities and submitted all the data of the study to the authority, and competitors could not get access to this data. 
In the last, let me say, around five years, this development changed from protection um, to research data in a direction of transparency to research data. Um, the idea, which was also pushed forward by the um, European Medicine Agency and by the um, um, European um, legislator, was to make um, clinical research data more transparent um, for various reasons, in particular also to allow other researchers to look into these data and to avoid unnecessary duplications of clinical trials and also that other companies and other sponsors can learn from the results out of a previous data. And this development um, started with the um, EMA policy on proactive release of marketing authorizations dossiers, which does not apply to homeopathic medicinal products because our products are not authorized at EMA. However, the development goes now on with the clinical, um, with the clinical trial regulation, which, came in, with, which was published in 2014 and which will likely come into force, I think, in 2080s when all the requirements are fulfilled. And at that point of time, the applicants of a clinical trial and later on or the sponsor of a clinical trial, trial has quite to um, put a lot of information into this new EU portal. Um, for example, a comprehensive summary of the clinical trial report also needs to put into this um, database, into this EU portal. And in addition to that, when we submit um, marketing authorization dossiers to the competent national authorities, which do contain results of clinical data, um, depending on the national law, there is always the possibility that somebody uh, addresses to the authority and asks for access based on freedom of information requests. So at the end of the day, the con concern of the researching industry is that the industry invests, the researching um, company invests a lot of money into clinical trial. If, it is, if the company is lucky, gets a marketing authorization based on this trial, and at the end of the day, a competitor um, does nothing else, then goes through the databases and um, via Freedom of Information Act put together all the information he can get and um, submits this collection of information and then simply makes the argument, have a look, I have the same homeopathic medicinal product and here are the results of the study of the competitor which I collected. I also want to get um, the same marketing authorization. And um, this risk has not fully been addressed so far. Um, there are some provisions in the notice to the applicants um, in, in, the European, in the European guidelines. Um, however, what I would like to emphasize, and that's, I think, also very important um, for the authorities when they are approached um, to um, grant access to documents based on Freedom of Information um, Acts, that they take into account that they are con commercially confidential information of the researching um, companies and ask the companies um, before they hand over any information or grant access and also that they um, follow um, the principles of the notice to the applicants and say as long as a generic application is not possible because the timelines for data exclusivity have not expired and apply this rule in an, 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 an <coughs> and, and apply this rule also for products where no generic applications are possible, at least these timelines, and do not grant access um, or allow reference to these documents, that would be very helpful to simply avoid that one company invests a lot of money in a clinical research generates the data, submits it to the authority, and finally the competitors load down all the documents they can get and end up with the same marketing authorizations. I think there is awareness in, um, in several authorities, but um, there is not, um, no full clarity, and I just I don't want to dig into all the topics and all the legal details and what is commercially confidential, what is not commercially confidential, because that's all subject to um, disputes currently. However, I would simply 
try to raise awareness um, that before um, data are disclosed or before applications are um, allowed that um, also the authorities should think about that there is an issue and give the concerned company the possibility to comment. So maybe if, if uh, the, the re um, Professor Knoes or, or perhaps um, uh, uh, Ms. Lay could comment on this, how uh, do they have a perspective on this? Um, we, <clears throat> we, we only have a partial perspective on this because this is a kind of EU regulation which we cannot change them and we have to follow it. Um, in so far, I see the concerns um, of Dr. Herr. Um, nevertheless, I have to state, um, if we are really talking about clinical trials and also this um, Act for Freedom of Information, then usually we have a routine process where lawyers um, at our authority check the data and uh, try to sort out what is confidential and what is not confidential. In this way, um, if we're really talking about new clinical trials and, and innovation, I think um, there is a limited uh, option for protection um, because not, not all the data which are then necessary um, for a copy of uh, such an authorization based on a trial would be available in the free domain. Um, nevertheless, there may be some rest concern and I think this is a problem always in innovation in homeopathy that uh, the companies are hesitating to invest money and, and also often um, we are requested as authority what kind of data we should present to you in order to have uh, some innovation and we can just only ask, answer yes we need the data and then we can tell you whether this data are suitable for any step forward because uh, we cannot predict it before. It's anyway, with innovation in homeopathy, we are going always into a new terrain. And this is, of course, where regulators have to be a little bit reluctant and say, we must first see data, and then we can judge whether this may be a step forward. So, so hypothetically, if what we described what's happening in the U HPUS, we've defined a framework for that. There is a proving, let's say it's a brand new substance. We have a proving We've done some uh, clinical studies, maybe not even a clinical trial, but we've done some uh, case series, and we have uh, uh, rigid observational studies indicating that certain homeopathic prescribing indicators for that, for that medicine would be valid. Is that something that you would consider then, even if there were no clinical trial whatsoever? Because I don't want to focus the discussion just on clinical trials. Now, in, um, if you are talking about homeopathy, um, this is a clear statement of just the German authority, yes, we would be open to look at such a set of data because for us, the homeopathic proving is the most evident um, 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 proof for efficacy which is used in homeopathy and, and accepted so far. Um, in this way, we as an authority would at least have a look at such data, um, but we must be clear the regulation in Europe is not harmonized in this way. It leaves a space to every member state to consider whether marketing authorizations are possible or not. But there are different settings and there are other countries um, where I think we also have to expect them if the interpretation is different and they would not be willing to look at such a limited set of data. How will you like it's just proving is enough just or is there any question about the quality of that proving? Of course, there is a question. This is always for us. Uh, it must be not one proving because this is also um, essential that, that you must have a replicator, so not a, just a one trial. Um, and then, of course, we must be convinced that uh, everything has been valid in this case. And um, I think um, also Robert was talking about a whole bundle of data. Um, so, and it would depend always um, what is the raw material, how the stock uh, was implemented. So, everything else would be taken into account. And um, you must be aware, it's uh, when we are talking about innovation, of course, there will be um, strict requirements, but, but we are open to consider this. And just as a statement, um, the provings would be a starting point, but this must all be then done on a sound scientific base. 
Uh, Ms. Lay, would you comment on this from a French perspective, whether, whether that would be considered or... Oh, sorry. I apologize. I thought she was on the table. <laughs> no. uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. I was, I was outside, but the, I understand that the, the question is about the, how recognize the cl uh, clinical trials in, in dossier, homeopathic dossier, uh, and how it is protected. Is this is the question. Yes, there were two, two questions. In fact, one was linked to the protection of if a company has invested into a clinical trial. And the other question was related to the fact that if what's, for instance, being developed in the HPOS is part of the monograph approval process, there's a mixture of proving data and clinical data that could be maybe a case series, observational study, a mix of, of the, those data, whether and those data point into the direction of a homeopathic drug picture, so in line with homeopathic philosophy, whether that would then be considered by, by the authorities. Um, yes, of course it would be considered. It's also the, up to the company to, to put in, in, in specific uh, way, maybe uh, for homopathic, uh, I fully support the, 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 the position of uh, the German. It's also we are aware, but we are also waiting for how, how it could be uh, submit. We have also the option of the well-established use, uh, but it's not for, for specific uh, preparations uh, with uh, the approach of well-established use after 10, 10, year, 10 years in, on the market, uh, with also clinical trials for totally innovative products. Uh, this is up to, the, we have to see what, what could happen. Uh, uh, of course, uh, within the regulation, it's it's a bit uh, um, uh, it's it's uh, how how can we handle this concerning the protection? Uh, of course, uh, but for all the products, the, there is a law who who, who allows uh, and and our lawyers also check what is can be. Uh, um, what is uh, private, what is not private, what can be open. But in any case, we, we, can, we can also, we can be, of course, the, the approach of a mixture is, a, is an option. Yeah, and then we maybe, move on maybe to a short amendment just only because uh, I also want you to understand the regulatory authorities and we are also always confronted with a comparison of indications maybe from chemical synthetic products and homeopathic products. And so our Commission D therefore um, elaborated a paper which you can translate just in a sense, um, the higher the indication, um, the more data we expect. So for example, um, if you just take what I said uh, a minute before and, and you then just say, oh, I make uh, two provings and then come up with uh, some sensational indication in oncology, this will not work. So but, just but that would not be the spirit. The, the, no, no. The, the application would be more going in a direction, can this be used for homeopathic purposes? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just uh, um, for, a, for a marketing authorization already granted with uh, some new indication or new category of patients, for example, that would be also really, really well welcome. Uh, just, just having a formula already granted by a marketing authorization and then extend uh, an indication to another population or find another indication for, this, for, for another population, that would be really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jay Bourne wanted to say something. Just really quickly, uh, to build off what Dr. Harris said, um, if you have a truly new substance coming into the homeopathic pharmacopoeia of the United States, not a substance that's been in clinical use where there are provings being done so that it can be officialized, but truly a new substance, then our understanding is that you can ring fence that substance uh, with intellectual property protection prior to going through the studies per the scheme that you and, and Dr. Hoover showed you know, going forward. So um, this doesn't mean there, that there's a substance that's in use and now we're gonna run provings and we're gonna try and put it into the pharmacopoeia by way of that, of, of that data collection, but this is a truly new substance, it's truly unique then before you do your trials, you can go out and ring fence that IP 
Um, and then you have a certain period of time. I mean, Gunter is much more uh, versed in this, but, but the, it's truly a very specific case, which is a new drug. Comment, and then I'll give you, uh, Jacques. You want to comment on this comment? Yeah, um, there um, you have a great advantage in the U.S. regarding IP, IP protection and patents. In Europe, the situation.